Um, my name is Raymond Schifflers. I'm chairing uh, this session, so I'll, I'll briefly introduce myself. I work at the University Medical Center in, uh, in Utrecht. And today uh, we're going to talk in this session about extracellular vesicles. Um, and the hypothesis that we explore within my laboratory is, could extracellular vesicles be natural drug delivery systems? But to, re to, to, to start working on that, we have to realize that it's actually quite complex. Um, because there are different types of vesicles produced by cells. Um, they either can be released from these organelles, multifasicular bodies, that upon fusion with the cell membrane are released as a bunch, and these are known as exosomes, and others are shed from the cell surface, and these are known as microvesicles. So even if a cell is normally producing extracellular vesicles, it will be of two different types. And it's very difficult to separate these two because they have overlapping characteristics. So in the majority of cases, you work with a mixture of these types of vesicles. Um, then, of course, there's the issue of the complexity. There are thousands of molecules uh, inside and on uh, an extracellular vesicle, RNAs, DNA fragments, different types of uh, proteins, either soluble ones or membrane proteins, and dependent on the state that the cell was in while it was producing those extracellular vesicles, the composition will be different, and that is something that is important to realize that it's a staggeringly complex uh, delivery system, if you think of it in, uh, in such a way. And if you compare that to the very simple systems, that, the synthetic systems that we are used to work with, um, well, for example, the liposomes that resemble um, these, uh, these extracellular vesicles in uh, some structural components, namely the lipid bilayer. Um, well, for extracellular vesicles, we were interested in what they could achieve by looking at their tissue distribution first. And for um, these types of synthetic drug delivery systems, much emphasis has been on circulation time. Um, and this is the, the image for the classical liposomes rapidly opsonized in the circulation, and they uh, are rapidly recognized by macrophages in the liver and the spleen. And these are the pegylated versions, and they circulate for a prolonged period of time, and they show especially the heart region. You still see uptake in the liver and the spleen, but they circulate for a very long time, and that allows them to exploit um, extravasation into areas of inflammation, for example, in rheumatoid arthritis here, in these joints. Um, here, Kaposi sarcoma lesions, synovitis over here, a lung tumor, and bone infection. Um, so it doesn't really matter for these synthetic drug delivery systems whether, uh, what the trigger is for the inflammatory response. As long as there's inflammation and long circulation time, they will accumulate there. So how does that compare to extracellular vesicles? Well, we've injected them, and they look like first-generation liposomes if we, um, if, we, if we isolate that. So um, this is what the image that we get. You can already see that uh, the liver is very bright here, and this is the, uh, the, the, this, or this is the spleen and this is the liver. Um, and here, there's a subcutaneous tumor implanted, and hardly any of the extracellular vesicles that were injected actually reach uh, the site that we were interested in. They look exactly like first-generation liposomes. Um, so that motivated us in the lab to try and uh, work on the surface of these extracellular vesicles and see if we can redirect them in one way or another. Um, so either these extracellular vesicles act locally, that could be one of the interpretations on, of the fact that they are so rapidly cleared, or we maltreat them by isolation or the labeling procedure, or it could be that a small subpopulation is designated for systemic delivery of signals, but, and we isolate them altogether. So we worked on a variety of technologies to, to try and decorate the surface of extracellular vesicles to try and tweak their specificity. Um, we worked on post-insertion, a well-described uh, technology for the, uh, for the liposome field. Uh, we worked with sticky targeting ligands that are super glued to the surface of extracellular vesicles. And we fuse targeting ligands with membrane proteins during production. And I will discuss these two options uh, today. Um, so we made a super glue, basically, to stick a targeting ligand on the surface of an extracellular vesicle. So we make nanobodies, um, and those are targeted against the epidermal growth factor receptor, and they are fused to a domain of a C1, C2 domain of lactadherin, and that has a high affinity for phosphatidyl serine, which is present in this, on the surface of these extracellular vesicles. So you will have the C1, C2 domain and the nanobody exposed on the surface. 
Um, well, we see, first of all, that phosphatidylserine binding is indeed there. So this is, uh, this is a dot blot of phosphatidyl serine concentrations. And you see that very nicely the, uh, the C1, C2 domain uh, binds to the phosphatidylserine and not to another negatively charged phospholipid and also not to any of the other lipids shown here. Uh, and at the same time, the EGFR binding is preserved of this, uh, of this nanobody. And nicely, um, you see that the binding of these vesicles, of these decorated vesicles to EGFR positive cells is, uh, is also there. This is neuro 2 a cells. These are cells that hardly have epidermal growth factor receptor uh, on their surface and there's no binding. Uh, but with A431 cells, those are cells with a high epidermal growth factor receptor expression. You see a very clear dependency of extracellular vesicle binding based on uh, EGA1, the EGFR binding nanobody on the, on the, on the surface. Um, another um, way to decorate the surface is by um, using post-insertion. And for that, we used micelles of polyethylene glycol coupled to a, a phospholipid. And you, if you bring them into water, they form micelles. To the micelles, you can couple the nanobody again, the targeting ligand. And if you incubate them with extracellular vesicles and increase the temperature a bit, they will spontaneously insert into the membrane and decorate the surface of the extracellular vesicles. Um, well, we've optimized the, uh, the post-insertion uh, procedure, and it appears that at approximately 40 degrees, uh, you see very nice insertion of our uh, pegylated nanobody inside the membrane. Uh, well, you can see the morphology of these uh, extracellular vesicles, which is not really affected by the micelle uh, incubation. You can see with colloidal gold labeling of the nanobody uh, that it's actually present on the surface. So we've decorated our extracellular vesicles with polyethylene glycol and a nanobody. And uh, we actually see the same thing. Negative uh, cells that do not express the EGFR there's no interaction with the cells, but with the A431 cells that have a high epidermal growth factor receptor expression, you see very nicely that uh, the nanobody dictates the interaction with uh, the target cells. Um, how does that change the insertion of the polyethylene glycol and the nanobody, the distribution within the body? Well, unfortunately, up to a very little extent. We can measure that there is prolonged circulation time of these pegylated, nanobody-decorated extracellular vesicles, but it's really the majority of the dose is lost within the first minutes after injection. And, um, well, this is the original EVs, largest dose in the liver, very small percentage in the spleen, and what is lost in the liver, probably by the pegylation, is actually taken over by the spleen, and still no accumulation in the tumor. Um, so, the conclusion is up to them. Engineering of EVs is possible by post-insertion chemical coupling. Um, the pegylated version displays prolonged circulation time, but the tissue distribution still remains challenging. Um, at the same time, we are very interested in how extracellular vesicles could actually transfer RNA cargo. And for that, we worked with a very sensitive way of looking at um, RNA transfer by engineering a donor cell. This is the blue donor cell um, that expresses Cree messenger RNA, and that Cree messenger RNA is partly packaged inside the extracellular vesicles. We also have an acceptor cell, and that has been engineered to have red fluorescent protein expression between, uh, uh, and a stop codon between two lock sites. So if Cree messenger RNA arrives in the target cell and is translated into the Cree protein, the Cree recombinase will cut out the uh, red fluorescent protein and the stop codon, and instead, green fluorescent protein will be expressed. So you see a color change from red to green if there's successful um, uh, transfer of the messenger RNA inside vesicles. Um, this is just a characterization, about 100 nanometer particles. Uh, they, we cannot detect Cree uh, on the Western blot, Cree protein inside the vesicles, but we can amplify the Cree messenger RNA inside the vesicles. And if you do a co-incubation with the donor cells uh, in the transwell system and the acceptor cells below, if there are don no donor cells, of course, none of the cells turn uh, red. But here, you see green cells appearing if uh, the donor cells are present. And it really depends on the type of uh, a reporter cell that is there, because sometimes you only achieve half a percent approximately, 
but sometimes it can actually be tenfold higher, 5%. So that, that, um, the, the match between donor and acceptor is apparently important. Uh, that's nice in vitro, um, but it's actually also happening in vivo. So if you co-implant um, uh, co the donor tumors uh, together with the uh, reporter tumor cells, then you actually also see green cells appearing. So there appears to be also local communication. And what is even more striking is that that also happens over a distance. So also if you implant um, the donor cell in one, donor tumors in one flank of the mouse and the acceptor tumors in another flank of the mouse, you still see these green cells appearing. So that is, I think, one of the most striking biologically, uh, biological relevance uh, of, uh, of extracellular vesicles. Um, one of the crucial elements, of course, in the efficiency of, of messenger RNA transfer is how many messenger RNAs are there inside a vesicle. So how do we judge the number of green cells that appear there? And, uh, well, there's a question for the audience. Gregor, you cannot uh, participate. <laughs> how many uh, messenger RNAs do you think are there in, in a vesicle? Any suggestions, any thoughts? One. It's actually, it's, it's 40,000 to one. Uh, but the ratio is the other way around. It's extracellular vesicles to messenger RNA. So the vast majority of extracellular vesicles does not contain the messenger RNA of interest. And uh, with that in mind, it actually is quite efficient, those couple of green cells that are appearing. And that still motivates us to, to keep on going. Um, so in conclusion, overall, EVs uh, behave like other nanocarriers regarding tissue distribution. Shielding improves circulation time, a little bit, and targeting ligands improve the specificity in, in vitro, and there's a remarkable transfer of RNA in vivo. And with that, I'd like to conclude and uh, invite you uh, for questions. Thank you. Um, questions, if, if, you, if you would go to the microphone um, to, uh, to ask the questions, because it's uh, videotaped, then... Uh, that's old-fashioned videotape yeah. because it's recorded. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the great talk. That's excellent that you show that they actually travel from one side to the other. Mm -hmm. um, so we've read in the literature a lot of reports on like a two-minute half-life yeah. of these vesicles, but that's yeah. not actually what we see. Mm -hmm. So I, we see like half an hour. So I'm wondering whether it's you think it's due to the labeling and whether some of these labels actually mm -hmm. stimulate the innate immune system for in, uh, Increase clearance. Yeah. Um, I, w I'm quite confident about the labeling procedure that we use, and we s saw it with different labels. Um, what I'm not so confident about is um, the, 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 the isolation procedure itself, that that might compromise the integrity of the extracellular vesicles or, um, um, uh, or maltreat them in such a way. And it could also be that some of the loosely associated proteins that, that are there during the formation and that are actually important for biological function are lost during the whole isolation yeah. procedure. And upon reinfusion, well, you, you see the, uh, the, the short half-life that we see here. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay. Yes, please. Thank you, it was a great talk. So uh, we saw that the delivery is really efficient, yeah. but not the loading. Mm -hmm. So any idea on how to improve the loading <laughs> yeah. without that's, an that's expensive the... protocol to put a lot of genetic materials into the yeah. transfected cells? And uh, so yeah, absolutely. I think that's the million dollar question. Um, actually, much more uh, probably for <laughs> if, you, if you can come up with a good solution. Um, so uh, we've tried electroporation. Uh, electroporation in our hands at least doesn't work, although a clinical trial has been started with electroporated extracellular vesicles. Uh, but what we see is that if you electroporate that there are nano aggregates formed between the ions that are liberated from the, uh, from the electrodes and that precipitate and look like encapsulation, but it's actually not. Um, so that, is, uh, that doesn't work. Uh, we've tried overexpression, and overexpression only gets you so far. It's about four to five fold enhancement, uh, and that is driving the expression like, uh, yeah, <laughs> like there's nothing else being produced. Um, so, of limited effect, but it, it does result in, 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 in a sort of stochastic uh, increase in, uh, in expression. I think that one of the most intriguing possibilities is trying to fuse. Um, uh, extracellular vesicles with synthetic delivery systems that have really efficiently captured uh, the sRNA. So uh, 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 an ordinary cationic lipid complexed RNA 
and then fuse that together with your extracellular vesicle and, well, hoping that the, the good properties of extracellular vesicles are preserved. And that is, of course, the challenge then, I think. Um, Gert, yes? Um, this, the, the involvement of a PS signal mm -hmm. in the clearance of the extracellular vesicles of the exosomes, is that not indicative of that the physiological fate of these nanoparticles are MPS systems? Yeah. So uh, 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 uptake by macrophages and yeah. get rid of them. Um, it, it, it seems um, we, we are doing subpopulation analysis now, so we, we see that part of the, um, of the extracellular vesicles are PS positive, and you can capture those and get them out of the uh, population. So not all extracellular vesicles are highly PS positive, so that is one of the distinction I'd like to make. But I'm, I agree that well, PS is known as, a, as an eat-me signal, and the moment that it's exposed on cells at least, they are meant to be destroyed and meant to be cleared, and also I think these types of vesicles probably represent a subpopulation that is more likely to be taken up by macrophages than the other uh, subpopulations. And, and if you would like to prolong the circulation time, yeah. is it maybe because the surface is also decorated with many molecules that you would need a much denser PEG cloud yeah. on the uh, particles yeah. to yeah. get some longer circulation yeah. time? That's, 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 that's likely, because the post-insertion uh, will only get you to a, well, to a limited coating uh, density. Uh, and of course, for example, a chemical coupling uh, reaction might, be more, uh, might yield higher PEG densities in that respect. Thanks a lot. Uh, with that, uh, uh, I'd like to conclude and give the floor to the next speaker, Joy Wolfram. Um, and she will speak about engineering extracellular vesicles and trying to deliver them to the brain.